Welcome to season three of Outstanding Women Leaders Witty and Wise Conversations. I'm your host, Katie L. Eads, leadership and relationship coach by day, comedian and writer by night. I'm on a mission to host 100 million witty and wise conversations that disrupt the way leaders think and the way the world lives in relationship to each other. It's time to start connecting our left and right brain to our loving hearts and begin listening to what they have to say. The brain will want to continue on the path previously traveled. It feels safe there. The heart sometimes barely has a path, allowing passion and purpose to dictate the way. Get ready to disrupt business as usual in your brain and get ready to start following your heart. Listen, it's calling for you. My heart is always calling for me to dance in conversation, to feel the rhythm and vibrations, the ebbs and flows as we exchange energies, wit, and wisdom. My brain is interjecting really quick to invite you to check out owlprofessionalcoaching.com backslash podcast for more episodes and to head over to Apple Podcasts or Podbean and write us a quick review. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Owl Professional Coaching or at Outstanding Women Leaders. Today, we have four rules to guide our wit and wisdom exchange. Inspired by the Coactive Training Institute, these create space for powerful connection and authenticity. Rule number one, nobody gets to be wrong. Rule number two, nobody gets to be right. Rule number three, everybody gets to be vulnerable. And my favorite, rule number four, everything is included. If your child walks in, the phone rings, everything goes into the podcast. We do not edit here. This conversation is exactly what it needs to be in this moment in time. We've asked our guests to join us via video to allow us to create authentic connection. Eyes are the window to the soul. You will be seen, you will be heard, there is space for you here. This conversation comes to a close. I'll ask our guests three questions. If you've tuned in before, you know what they are. If you haven't, you don't want to miss them. But enough about me. Let's welcome our incredible guest, Kathleen Maxian. Is that how I pronounce your last name? Perfect. She brings a passionate and personal perspective to her role as president and founder of the Ovarian Cancer Project, OCP. After being diagnosed with a disease in 2009, she learned that a simple genetic test could have prevented the likelihood of her cancer. Because of the inherited BRCA1 gene mutation, she was predisposed to breast and ovarian cancer that in fact could have been detected through comprehensive genetic testing and prevented with prophylactic surgeries. Those genetic tests are now readily available to American women thanks to a 2013 U.S. Supreme Court decision that declared it illegal for any biotechnology company to hold a patent on a gene, which up until then had been the situation. This woman has an incredible story to share with us. I could read more of her bio, but I just want to get right into having her share because she's been a part of the Supreme Court case. Uh, she's been told you're not going to live. You have a 20 percent chance of living. And here she is. Um, so without further ado, welcome. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. This, as a woman, all, all of us listening are, um, we know someone that's been affected by cancer and your story is incredibly powerful. So let's just hop in and share um, from diagnosis to fighting the man in Supreme Court and meeting RGB. I mean, <laughs> share everything. So I'd love to tell you that I, I, um, I met RGB, but I, but I haven't. So the Supreme Court really doesn't operate like that. It's, it's an interesting, it's interesting, you know, these Supreme Court cases. I think when I um, first got the call uh, that my story lent itself to the case, um, I envisioned being in a courtroom like Perry Mason on television, um, but really learned a lot about how our court system works and, um, so there's a lot of briefs that the that the um, the Supreme Court is uh, taking a look at, and certainly um, my story lent itself to what the case was about. And the case was basically about um, a company by the name of Myriad Genetics going to the U.S. Patent Office and saying, "Hey, we want a patent in human gene," and the U.S. Patent Office allowed them to do it. So it's a little bit different than taking something that's a widget, right? Or um, you know something something like this lip gloss, right? And going in and going, hey, I'm the only one that has this twisty thing to bring the lip gloss up and down, and we want to patent this. Um, and you know that that makes sense to me. What doesn't make sense to me is how you could go to the U.S. Patent Office and the Patent Office would say, sure, you can patent a part of um, 
uh, something that's in everyone's body, right? So even though not everyone may have an inherited mutation, right? We all have a BRCA, uh, a BRCA gene. So kind of let me, let me go back a little bit to how, how did I get involved in the Supreme Court case? So at the age of 47, and um, I got married when I was 42, I'd never been married before I met my husband at work. Uh, we hated each other and then got married. We knew each other for about six, well, I shouldn't say six years. We knew each other for maybe three years and um, really some funny stories about our relationship at work. But um, then when we, we did date, got together, we got married uh, six months later. So here I was five years married. We had just bought this house and um, I wasn't feeling well and uh, called my college roommate and said, hey, you know, is this, what's happening with you? Are you, you know, bleeding heavily or what's, you know, going on? And she was like, yeah, menopause, maybe, da, 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 da. And then that kind of went, that symptom kind of went away. And so I called my gynecologist and I said, what do you think? You know, I'm having this, you know, intermittent bleeding. Um, and he said, you know, if it happens for a couple more weeks, come in and see me. And a month later, I made an appointment with him. And then uh, he called me and we did some tests, a transvaginal ultrasound um, and a blood test called a CA-125. And he called me on a Monday and he said, hey, we have your test results. And, oh, honey, I think you have ovarian cancer. And uh, at the everything happened very quickly as I'm sure other guests with cancer or your audience knows when you know somebody who is diagnosed with cancer, everything happens really quickly, surgeries and chemos and treatment plans and things like that. And so, um, I asked for, after my surgery, I asked for my prognosis. And I never realized really how pragmatic I was because uh, it's a pretty brave thing to do, ask for your prognosis, especially when you know ovarian cancer isn't a good, a good one, an easy cancer. And my doctor said, you have a 20% chance of living for five years. And um, you know that's incredibly devastating. Uh, I think even though I had read it already on the internet, um, having her say that about my particular case was really, really tough. And when, when we finished talking, I thought she was gonna send me off to the chemo nurse. And she said, no, Kathleen, she said, um, you know, I wanted to talk to you about something. Your mom had mentioned after your surgery that your sister had had breast cancer. And I put my hand up very quickly and I said, oh, no, 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 Dr. DuPont, I know what you're gonna say. Um, you think our family has this genetic mutation, but we don't because my sister had the test and her test came back negative that she didn't have it, right? So I thought, well, hopefully this doctor thinks that our family is smart enough to have had that comprehensive testing done. And while I was talking, Katie, I noticed that she put her head down. And when I finished talking, she brought her head back up and she looked at me and she said, Kathleen, do you think we could see your sister's paperwork? And in that moment, I knew something was very, very wrong. And I didn't really understand how it could be wrong. And on the way home, uh, I called my dad and I said, dad, remember when Eileen had cancer and she had that genetic test done and there was that only one company in the United States, it was a lab out in Utah and they were the best at it and they were the only ones who could do this testing. And I said, they wanna see Eileen's paperwork. So um, I just, when I got off the phone with them, I kept thinking it couldn't be wrong. It couldn't be wrong. I remember it was gonna be a really expensive test. And if we didn't have an extensive family history we were probably gonna to have to pay for it. And I remember talking to my sister one time and saying, you know, Eileen, I know this is really expensive, three or $4,000, you know, I'd be happy to help pay for this because it affects our whole family. Um, and in particular me, I was concerned about myself. Um, you know, could I be the next one to have breast cancer? Um, so she, Eileen at that point went back to her genetic counselor 
And her genetic counselor told her that now that I had ovarian cancer, she was now, she now qualified to have the second part of the test, which I don't, I don't really understand, you know, if this comprehensive test is wrong, then it's wrong regardless of whether I have cancer or not, but this is the qualification. And um, she took that second part of the test and showed that she did have the BRCA mutation. And so this was, I, I will tell you, this was probably one of the most devastating days of my life uh, to learn. My parents called me and told me what had happened. And I remember my mom was in the background and she was crying, but she was saying, it's no one's fault, it's no one's fault. And here I am with advanced stage ovarian cancer. I'm in treatment now. The treatment is IP chemotherapy, which is called interperitoneal chemotherapy, where they're literally, um, I have two ports in my body and they're literally putting the chemo into my belly. And it is only 40% of women make it through this IP chemotherapy. And I am sick. <laughs> I am really, really sick. Um, and, and here was my mother in the background going, it's no one's fault, it's no one's fault. But all I could think, Katie, honestly was, oh my God, if they had done that test correctly the first time, if they had given her the comprehensive test that we thought we were getting, why would it matter that she got the second part when I got diagnosed with ovarian cancer? Wasn't the point of, wasn't the point of having these tests to help other family members. We already know that this person has cancer, but to help other family members make decisions that could mean life or death. And again, you know, I know everyone's looking at this very healthy looking person over here, right on your podcast. But if I could, you know, tell you how sick I was and, and how scared I was, and I was just fresh off of hearing you have a 20% chance of living for five years. It was absolutely devastating. And from that moment on, I started walking around. I started talking to people about this. People would come over and visit and I'd like start talking. I'd go, you know, this company, they had this, this test and they didn't give the whole test. And I was just like mental about it, just totally so focused on it and so angry and felt as though I missed my chance to have my prophylactic oophorectomy, which is the removal of the ovaries and hysterectomy. I was 47 at the time. I was 42 when I got married. My husband's 15 years older than me. There's no way we were having kids, right? I wouldn't have been a good mother. I would have like left the baby on the top of the car, right? you know, and driven away the bassinet or whatever those baby cure things would be on the top. It just, you know, it wasn't something that was going to happen. So I wasn't a young woman, you know, worrying about, you know, whether I wanted to do fertility preservation or something like that. I was somebody that was at an age that, yeah, it would, it would certainly affect me, but not, um, but not in a way that would be, you know, life changing. So um, I'll fast forward so I'm, you know, I'm obsessed with this idea that this company has wronged me. And I'll fast forward um, about 14 months later, um, my cancer came back. And so uh, now I had recurrent ovary cancer. And so statistically um, at the time, women who had a recurrent ovarian cancer had about 18 months to live. And I get a phone call from my genetic counselor and she said, there's a woman who I know, um, who I'd like you to talk to and she'd like to call you. And I was like, okay, yeah. And it has to do with how you were, you know, how you, got, how you knew about this genetic mess. And so I pick up the phone one day and on the other end of the phone is Ellen Matloff. And Ellen at the time was the director of genetics at Yale. And I remember sitting in my dining room uh, talking to her and she asked me to tell her my story and I told her basically the same thing that I've told all of you and she said you know Kathleen there's this case and it's going back and forth between you know the appellate courts and the 
Supreme Court and she said, your story really lends itself to why we don't want these companies and this company in particular to patent human genes because this is the kind of thing that can happen. And we'd like to, um, you know, we'd like you to be interviewed by, by um, people. And she said, we'd also like to get a video of you. And I understood, I understood they knew that um, it would be important to get the story on tape because, you know, I probably wasn't going to be here by the time the case got through the Supreme Court. And so began um, this crazy life that I had for the next two years of being called by, um, I, there was a, a, a woman at the ACLU, Robin, who would call me and she would say, you know, we have an interview set up with uh, the New York Times. They'd like to talk to you. Would you be willing to talk to them? Yes, I would. Okay, can I give Andrew Pollack your name and number? Absolutely. And then I'd talk to him about the case. They'd call me Elizabeth Cohen from CNN is interested in your story. Would you talk to her? And, you know, on a Friday night, I could hear her kids in the background. You know, she and I chatted. And um, I remember her saying to me, you know, your story, it's simple, but it's very complicated. You know, getting to it, it's, it's, it's a complicated story, but it's really simple. And I love that she said that to me because it is, it's very simple. When we allow companies to patent things that are, human, right? And in your opening, I love that you said, I'm just a human sitting here talking to you. You know, the whole, um, those things are not things that someone has made, right? Someone has come up with the widget, um, the idea that was turned into, you know, this lens and this glass, glasses. And, these are things that are part of our DNA and how anyone could think that those things are patentable is beyond me. And I am someone who has felt the ramifications of a company doing this and then making a decision about what part of this test we're going to allow. And I wanna go back to Ellen Matloff for a second. I don't think I really understood in the very beginning what was going on. She did say to me that this company had written her a letter and told her that she needed to cease and desist what she was doing. But I don't think I really understood until after the case um, and then even further in discussing this case with other people. She was at the time doing some patch testing and the patch testing was for exactly people like our family who um, who at the time, the type, the mutation that I have on the BR, BRCA gene was something that was very, very rare and they didn't know a lot about. And so the decision was made. And if you, and if you listen to the company, they're saying the decision was made by the insurance companies who weren't gonna pay for this. And I just, I, I don't know if it's since having cancer or maybe I'm, I've always been like this, but I've got a really, low threshold for bull. And it had to do with money. It didn't have to do with an insurance company doing something. It had to do with money. It had to do with the almighty dollar. And I think that's something that's, that's incredibly scary for me as well, is that you're somehow putting money ahead of human beings. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope I'm not sounding to some of your listeners, you know, I'm against, you know, people making money or corporations or anything like that. And I'm not, but what I am against is using something um, that's, that's, that's a human gene as part of a way to, by patenting that as a, a part of a way to make money. Um, and I don't know, maybe, maybe if the head of uh, Myriad wasn't a venture capitalist, 
<laughs> you know, I'd feel a little bit differently. You know, if the guy was a scientist or something, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I equate it to like the white, you know, the white man showing up to the new land and they're like, oh, we found this land and now we're going to start making money off of it. And we're going to sell it. Um, it that it's is, a, wow, Katie, that's, that's such a great analogy. It really is a great analogy. And that does put it right and focused. Yes, exactly. Is that these are these are natural things? They're natural phenomena. So you haven't done anything um, that fabulous here, right? You discovered a land that people are living on. Bravo! You've discovered a gene that's in all of us. Congrats! Right, right, <laughs> right, great, great, great. And the thing is, we need to make sure, Katie, is that they didn't discover the gene, right? Mary Claire King discovered the BRCA genes on the human genome. And so Shocking. a man stealing a woman's discovery <laughs> <laughs> it all adds up, right? Columbus shows up. I found this land, <laughs> you know, the Vikings found it. So did these guys. Right. And so ask, though, it like, wasn't very clear to me who said, we're going to, we're going to patent this, right? Mm -hmm. And Jonas Salk said, you know, someone asked him if he was going to patent the vaccine, the vaccine for polio. And he said, you can't patent the sun. Yeah. So I think these are things that we need to, to keep in mind, um, the, the women that I met um, through this adventure of mine, right, um, were women who, of the likes that I've never met before. I mean, talk about women who were taking on big business. Ellen's Ellen, when I say they were going to sue her, they weren't going to sue her as the head of genetics at Yale. They weren't going to sue Yale. They sent it to her personally. We are going to take someone's life work, their livelihood, the good that they're doing by providing women with these patch tests with families like, like mine. Gee, that came back wrong but why do these two sisters why did one why is this so much look like brca but it's but this test is saying that it's not no one could even have a second opinion i work in the world of ovarian cancer right now i run a nonprofit called the ovarian cancer project we talk about second opinions all the time and how important they are we need a lot of great minds working on these things when we're talking about life and death issues, what we're, which we are talking about here, life and death, right? We're talking about the need to get a lot of great minds thinking about you, thinking about your cancer. How do we do that? Second opinions. Years ago, women had this test and they were making huge decisions about this. Young women talking about having their ovaries removed some not given opportunities for fertility preservation, um, having, their, having their ovaries removed that, you know, um, women like myself go into surgical menopause, you, you lose, you're losing a lot of who you are. You lose a lot of, you know, your sexuality. And, and there may be people who, um, there's a lot of women who, who are, you know, sexual counselors and things like that and say, oh, you can get this back. It's not the same, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure if you talk to Angelina Jolie, she would say to you, and here's a beautiful, stunning, sexy woman, right? Absolutely. It's not the same after her oophorectomy, after the removal of the breast. These are huge decisions. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I'm going to tell you that I'm not sure some days when I really think about this, if I don't feel lucky that I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer older and didn't have to make any of these decisions as a young woman. I mean, we're talking about some really serious um, decisions, some very difficult decisions, some life altering decisions that, that women are making based on the, these test results. What if that was wrong? Shouldn't I have be able to go to another company and have that test over again? We've all heard about, you know, tests that were wrong, right? So um, it, it's been, so th that part of the journey has been this 
insane roller coaster. The, the interviews continued and um, the day of the arguments, this is kind of funny. So the day, the day of the arguments was April 15th, 2013. And uh, CBS Evening News had been at my house the night before and interviewed me, you know, camera crew, producer, um, personality and interviewed me. And then the next day was were the arguments at the Supreme Court. And um, I got a phone call. My husband had gone out and I had gone out to walk the dog and my phone rang. It was the producer from uh, CBS. And she said, oh, she said, you know, there's been a bombing in at the marathon in Boston. And she said, I don't know if your story is going to get on, which I thought was pretty nice of somebody who's a, you know, a producer with, with CBS. And uh, they had taken some nice B-roll, right? Which I learned what that was. It's like a little extra footage. It's not the interview itself, it's like a little extra footage. And I was rock walking the dog across the front lawn and I was preempted by the uh, president of the United States. So not too many people can say that. You know, I was preempted by Barack Obama talking about the bombing. And then um, a couple months later in June, on June 6th, I was at a big like corporate event where they had a big health fair and I was there representing the ovarian cancer project, um, talking to women about the symptoms and risks of ovarian cancer. And uh, National Public Radio called me and it's really loud and there's these big tents and there's all this stuff going on. I'm like, hello. And they're like, yeah, this is NPR and uh, not the local station either. This is NPR in Boston, right? And so I go, yeah. And they're like, yeah, we were told that you would do an interview with us. And I was like, yeah, I, you know what? Today is not a good day. And the person on the other end didn't say anything. And I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe later I can call you back. And they were like, yeah, okay. And hung up the phone with me. And then 10 minutes later, I got another call from someone who said, hey, the case, you know, the result that it was released today. And it was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court, which is historic in itself. Um, and so I called NPR in Boston back and they were like, yeah, Nina Totenberg already did, you know, the interview with someone else. So she did say my name on, on radio though. And then I got a few other calls that I could actually respond to, but I wish, you know, to this day, I'm like, Hey, NPR, when you call somebody, man, tell them what it's about. Like, tell them what happened. Like, no, 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 it's not that interview. <laughs> I, I'm just curious as all this is happening, you still have in the background of I may not live. Um, what does what does a woman do but in addition to fighting the the man in Supreme Court, what does a woman do when she realizes that life may not have as many years as she thought? So I think I think when that when the court case came out, I think I thought in that moment, that that was my legacy mm. and that I had an opportunity to have a legacy um, because that is something I think that you think of when you're facing death, at least I did, you know, um, it would be an interesting question to ask, you know, people who are dying, do you have a legacy? What is it? And I remember that day when my gynecologist called me and said, oh, honey, we think you have ovarian cancer. I remember thinking, number one, this is really unfair to my husband right? 15 year old guy, he thought I was going to be taking care of him. And now, right, this young source of income for him is like sick. And the other thing was, I haven't done anything with my life yet. What am I doing? So I think in that moment, because my cancer had come back again in 2013, I think in that moment, I think I felt like I did it. You know, I helped move something big. I certainly didn't do it on my own. I mean, there were some incredible people. So um, Sandra Park, who is the attorney that handled the case in the ACLU's Women's Rights Unit, and the Women's Rights Unit was um, begun, started by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I mean, so talk about some big shoes to fill, you know, and what an amazing 
an amazing, amazing case this was. I mean, not only did, did we win the case, every single judge, every sim, single Supreme Court judge <laughs> agreed. So that in itself was historic. Um, unfortunately, right now in real time, there is some talk afoot about invalidating this case. And so, you know, again, in my mind, uh, and I love your analogy about the land, like, hey, there's this, here's this land, you know. Um, you know, that's very scary for me, v very scary. And I think incredibly wrong. And I think the, the scary part is, is that, you know, this isn't a story that's like really interesting and juicy in that, you know, everybody can relate to it and get it involved. You know, I kind of wish it was like about animals or <laughs> kids or something, you know. Um, God forbid we get excited and emotional about women. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Right. Not and I, <laughs> right. And I, and I also think, Katie, you know, look at um, this is, you know, I'm up against this all the time in, in, uh, with the ovarian cancer project is that, you know, uh, do I roll out my middle-aged women and show how sick they are and the grandmas that are missing out on stuff? You know, it's really hard when you're up against cancer hospitals showing, you know, happy little kids and it's just, you know, or, um, or, or, you know, animal rights groups. I mean, and every, those are all important things, but, you know, this is the redheaded stepchild of cancers over here. You know, people uh, hear about, about your work that you're doing with the nonprofit. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the work. So, um, we do we do a couple of things. One is we provide information on the symptoms and risks of ovarian cancer, and you know, ovarian cancer is known as this uh, silent killer, right? So it's not silent. We know um, Barbara Goff. Uh, out at the University of Washington in Seattle, did some studies in, between 2004 and 2007 that showed that ovarian cancer does have symptoms. Um, the symptoms are things like abdominal pain, bloating, urinary frequency, okay? The problem is, right, as you're listening to those things, you're going, oh boy, I got those right now. And your audience members are doing the same thing. They're very vague, they mimic other things, right? So it's really hard to know. But what we say to women is, look, if you have these symptoms and you have them for two weeks or longer, and this is something, you heard me talk earlier about calling my college roommate because I was bleeding, okay? Um, bleeding is, is certainly a symptom of gynecological cancer. It's not necessarily a symptom of ovarian cancer. I think that my cancer had progressed so far that it was interrupting probably my menses, right? So that's why I had this odd kind of thing happening. But, but bleeding is definitely um, endometrial cancer. Anytime you have bleeding that's not part of your menses, you should be going to your gynecologist and having that you know, checked out. I think it's really important that women on um, understand these symptoms because right now I'm hearing of younger women where their gynecologist is telling them come back in three years instead of the yearly. And so when hearing you talk about this, like this, you know, someone's married, they're not at risk for STDs. Like their, their doctors are saying, come back in three years. And when you're 40, we'll see you a little more often. It sounds a little scary when you start talking about everyday symptoms. Also do the gynecologists, if you just do go in once a year, are they going to catch this? Or is there some type of special test? So two things. One, since my diagnosis of ovarian cancer and getting involved in, in this, I never, honest to God, and I'm 58 right now, um, I never realized that when I went to the gynecologist, I went like a lemming, right? So my generation was told, you go to your gynecologist once a year. I had no idea what was happening during that time, right? You know, maybe if I had had a baby, I would have kind of known what was going on. 
Although I know there's some women in your audience going, no, they really don't tell you. <laughs> so, so part of this is women not being educated about why you're going to the gynecologist. Why, why are we going to a gynecologist? It's a cancer check. Okay. It's a cancer check. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a totally, so here's what my generation grew up as. Birth control was there, but you had to see a gynecologist. So if you wanted to have sex, you went to the gynecologist. Also, if you have sex, you might get an STD. So have them test for that at the gynecologist. No one ever said to my generation, every year you go to make sure you don't have cancer. And I think, you know, it's one of my dreams to, you know, start something, right? There's so many ideas, um, you know, to start something that's just an educational program for women. Some women have gotten this in college, some, some women who've taken like these great women's studies courses and things like that, take a deep dive into this. But honest to God, I could put up a picture of a uterus, some ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and the cervix, and probably most women in this country couldn't identify what part was what part. And I think that's really sad. You know, we we haven't, um, and it's it's amazing that it's 2021, right? And we're talk, still talking about this because it is um, it is oppressive to women. And we need gynecologists when we walk into their office go, okay, Kathleen, this is what you're here for today. I'm going to be, you know, and when they're inserting the speculum, instead of having that be the last thing that they say, except when they go little pinch, right? They need to say the speculum is inserted in your cervix. I'm taking this, you know, whatever swab or whatever it is. One, I'm gonna you've done that. You're absolutely right. They should. And do and do this. It should be they should be talking the whole time. They should be explaining it to you before it happens, right? The fact that women have gone for generations into a doctor's office, scooted down on the table with no panties on, and put their legs in those stirrups, and that it was mostly men doing this work, <laughs> whatever it was. The fact that that we women continued to go because it was something that we were told to do. You know, we, we didn't really question it. We, we may have questioned it individually, but collectively as a group of women, we didn't, we didn't collectively question our healthcare. And it, it may happen now just because healthcare is in, is in such a crisis it's the fifth leading accidental death in hospitals. Fifth leading cause of death is, is hospital error. So as I know, we're really afraid of things like the pandemic, which we should be, but ev this has been a, a lot scarier for a lot of people, including yourself. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, I think that's, this is how it's going to change. So we have gone in the 10 year of the ovarian cancer project, we have gone from the philosophy of teaching women. So besides doing the symptom and risk stuff, right? We also do um, supportive services for women who have ovarian cancer. And we have gone really from teaching women to advocate for themselves, right? We've gone from that to now more recently talking about shared decision making. And it's been a phenomenal and interesting transition as we instead of taking the healthcare system and saying, well, you know, you really need to go in there and advocate for yourself, Betty. Right? Which is an adversarial, yeah. right? It's good, right? We need to advocate for ourselves. We need to, right? But when it's in healthcare, now what if we do it this way? What if we go in and say, doctor, let's talk about my disease. I've educated myself outside of the system. You're going to help continue that education. And you're going to, and I love this, give me the menu of what I could do here. What are my choices? What are the ramifications for each of these things? And then let me fit that into my life. So often in Western medicine, it's been, you go to the hospital, you go to the doctor, you do what doctor says, right? 
now when you're talking about cancer, when you're talking about a cancer that has a trajectory of terminal, you know, making decisions with doctor about what's best for you. I the love right this. I absolutely love this partnership approach because when you, I'm a neuroscience background in, co in coaching. And so when the minute you come in as an advocate, you're putting your doctor's brain on defense to tell you why he actually is smart and doctors already have a God complex. So don't go in and, and let your doctor know. I love this idea of a partnership because it does allow that doctor to see you as what you are, not someone fighting him, but someone who wants to partner with them. And I say him because that's <laughs> my conditioning, right? To say him as a doctor. It is. If you're into, if you're into neuroscience, you have been conditioned to, to think that and to, 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 to think Dr. Nail. Yeah. It's yeah. changing. It's changing and we'll evolve with it, right? We'll evolve with it. But shared decision making, it puts a now, you know, if you're the type of person who um, is this, right? Oh my God, I can't, you know, just tell me what to do. Um, that creates a lot of anxiety too. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of factors involved in shared decision making. And we really try to be the ovarian cancer project really tries to be the organization on the outside that's helping with that. So some of the younger doctors are fabulous at this and, and you'll hear them go, okay, Katie, what are your goals, right? What are your goals? And this can be transitioned to, you know, any healthcare, right? What are your goals? What are you going to the doctor for? well, you know, I've had this repetitive um, sinus infection or you're going to the obstetrician, I'd like to get pregnant. You know, how do I not have, well, we all know how that happens. And if you don't, that's a different podcast, but the, you know, um, we wanna do this and how do we do this? Um, and I think the same, when you're talking about ovarian cancer, when you're talking about most women in the United States being diagnosed with advanced stage ovarian cancer, we can, do a, we can do this a couple of different ways. We can treat you till the day you die. You know, we know that we can treat you and I've seen it. I've seen women treated right up until the day they die. But what's the quality of life like there, right? What do you really want? And getting patients to talk about what they really want, right? One of the harshest things I ever heard was also one of the things that guides me in helping women. And it was, it, ju it was just the way it was stated, not that it's necessarily harsh, but it was, you know, do you want a good death or a bad death? And I'm like, what do you mean a good death or a bad death? All death is bad. Oh no, some death is worse than others. And so, you know, we were having these conversations with women. I'm, I'm running a group right now um, that we started uh, last year, right after the, right, right after COVID, the COVID shutdown. And I meet weekly with a group of women who've had multiple recurrences of ovarian cancer. You know, the chances of these women, um, you know, being cured are very slim right now. So we talk a lot about quality of life and, um, one of the women in our group uh, is 30, I think she's 35 now. Um, and it's been amazing to watch her through this transition and her, um, you know, planning her funeral and taking, um, you know, what a difficult thing to do, you know, right? Can you imagine 35 years old and the weight that it has lifted off of her to have, to have done this, you know, and how difficult it was to have these conversations with family that's going, oh, no, no, if you do this, you're giving up, right? They're stopping. Sometimes people are stopping that progress. So this group is a place where you're not going to have people stop that progress. You're not going to have people go, oh, no, no, you know, that's not going to happen or you're going to be fine, you know? So these end of life issues are, I will, I will tell you this is, um, probably some of the most meaningful work I've ever done in my life. It is, it is magnificent. I am inspired every single week. There's not a time that I get off of the Zoom video with these women where I'm not just, you know, human beings 
are amazing and they're resilient and they're able to handle things that they never thought they'd be able to handle, right? You see it all the time when you interview people, right? Because we're women are women are telling stories about what we've been through and how we got through it. I think women are really good at that. You know, we're really good at sharing with other women. Yeah. You know, Humans are really good at storytelling. You know, before we wrote things down, we should be passed down stories. And stories are our legacy. And I love this legacy that you're building with the Ovarian Cancer Project. How can people support the work that you're doing? Because it's so important and it's definitely filling a gap in healthcare where we have someone that supports people in their decisions and empowers them to invite people to partner with them versus in, you know, empowering them, disempowering them in some ways, advocating does kind of do that because you don't know what you're advocating for if you're not partnering with people. Right. So right, where, can right. We, where can people support this work? Where do we donate? Where do we find you? So, um, so yeah, so our website is ovariancancerproject.org, ovariancancerproject.org. And there, um, you know, you'll not only find a place to donate, but also um, importantly are the full list of symptoms of ovarian cancer, what to do if you think you have ovarian cancer. And then the second part is risk factors, personal. What are your personal risk factors for ovarian cancer? Very interesting. Women who've never had children, higher risk for ovarian cancer. Um, family history, someone in your family who's had cancer before the age of 50, pancreatic cancer, a father who had prostate cancer. My BRCA mutation comes from my dad's side, not my mom's. And that's something that people don't realize. Oh, you know what? That's on my dad's side of the family. It won't affect me as a woman. Um, you know, making sure um, that you're well-educated anytime you go to the doctor, right? We have the internet, read. There's great information on the internet. There's trusted websites on the internet. You know, we're smart enough. Women, women are smart enough. People are smart enough that you know what's right and what's not right. You know, not getting sucked into you know, conspiracy theories about things is the better way to go. Um, always good science, yeah. um, you know, follow that. That's so important. I think, especially when it comes to healthcare, um, this is not the type of thing that you want to put off. You know, you need to be able to go to your doctor and you need to be able to ask some intelligent questions. Yeah, the one of, uh, the, one of the few things I can agree on with Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. Trust your doctors, but verify the information. Um, humans make errors. And so if humor, humans are doing the tests, errors are going to happen. It is not, uh, it, I almost feel like it should, it, I don't wanna say the word entitled because I hate that word, but you, um, it's your information. You wanna make sure that that human that did the test had a good day, so verify. Um, before we go, I want to ask about your, my three questions that I always ask. I'm going to throw a fourth in because you clearly have it. So your, your legacy is you're facing, I don't know if I'm going to live, is the Supreme Court decision. Now your legacy is this ovarian cancer project. How do you want people to remember you? Uh, you know what, I'm just going to answer what, what came to my heart first and as someone who cared enough to do something about it. You know, somebody who, who, who said, you know, this is important work and I'm going to do this. You know, so many times, um, and it's a leap of faith to do that work, right? And I don't care whatever it is, but I want to be remembered as someone who cared enough to stay with these women and be with them and, and bring something to women with ovarian cancer that no one has ever done before. Mm. What's your superpower? Perseverance. Absolutely. I, yeah, perseverance. Yeah. Dogged perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> This is the part where I usually ask, what's your purpose? I feel like you've spoken to it, but 
if there's more to say, what's your purpose on earth? Compassion. Mm. My last question is what's next? I don't know, Katie, maybe a podcast. <laughs> I love this, giving a voice uh, to these women. I, you know, I guess something that and it may, it may have happened here, you know, anytime I'm talking to someone, especially a young, inquisitive mind like yours, and I'm sitting across from another really intelligent woman, and we're talking about going to the gynecologist. Like, we get like I'm thinking is that is that the not is that part of this? Like we gotta stop the madness, right? We need to stop this madness. We need to know why you're going to the gynecologist. Mm. It's the cancer. Like we should be able to. Women should be able to. Well, you know, it's that and the other thing. You know, this is why we're going. We should be able to talk to other women about this. No one knows. It's like it's a secret. <laughs> but you have to go right like that's part of what bugs me is that you hit but wait a minute you, but you have to go well did you go have you gone to the gynecologist thing well you know you have to go <laughs> why right why and if you knew the answer to that you'd be more comfortable not going for three years that's the problem right now is that women who are monogamous relationships have been told not to go. Oh, you don't need to come back for two near years now. You're okay. I can't come back for two years. That's what they hear. Right. Insurance won't pay for it. Okay. I'll be back when insurance covers it. But that's, that's not right. That's not it at all. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, you know, that might be my, it, look at, you might be my first guest. I would love that. And I would that be hysterical. <laughs> like this is something, this is something real. We got to talk about this. We, we women got to talk about this. We got to talk about this and we need to use the real names, you know, cervix, uterus, vagina. We need to use the, you know, we just, we need to teach little girls, right? just need to teach little girls too. This is all, it's all normal. It's part of our parts, right? How do we, what do they do? They're magnificent. I mean, can you believe women, right? Creating a baby in those, I mean, to talk about the miracle of life, right? And yet we're like, well, I don't know why I'm going. Or he told me not to come back in three years. You know, we don't, we're not, we gotta, we gotta like get on the same page. <laughs> Love that. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for leaving a legacy that so many women are going to benefit from, not just now, but in the future. You're incredible. I'm gonna give you the last words as, as I've talked enough. <laughs> last things you wanna share with the audience today. Um, I don't think it's about me. I, I think it's about you. I am, I am always inspired by young women. And I, um, you know, I was not a confident young woman. Um, I, did, I, did, I wasn't powerful. Like now I'm confident and I'm powerful. Like I'm the woman I always wanted to be. And I'm so amazed at young women. I don't know what the moms are doing out there or, you know, like what's happening, but you, you're, you know, you're the future, you, your audience, women who are your age. And I think that you're incredibly powerful young and I'm just, I'm happy I'm alive to kind of watch and see what you're doing, right? Like it's really, really neat. So it's exciting to be here and I'm, I'm impressed by you. So you inspire me. Keep, keep, keep going. Mm. You inspire me. Thank you so much, Kathleen. You're incredible. People head over to the ovarian cancer project.org. Check out the work, check out the important stuff you need to know about your own vagina, cervix, ovaries, 
all the fallopian tubes, all the words we don't usually use. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you, honey. Bye-bye.